What's up everybody? Welcome back to the Super Adventures. I know it's been a long time since I last uploaded a video, but I am so excited to be back. So, given that it's October, I thought that we could dedicate this month's videos to the spirit of Halloween. And what better way to do that than talking about zombie rats. So the paper that I'm going to be discussing today is titled Fatal Attraction in Rats Infected with Toxoplasm Gandhi. I will leave a link to that in the description below if you're interested. And I want to talk about these papers sort of in the same way that they would be organized in the actual paper. So if you wanted, you could actually open up this article and follow along uh, section by section with what I'll be talking about. So I want to start out by introducing the system that these scientists are studying. And that is this parasite known as Toxoplasm gondii or T. gondii. And so, like I said, this is a parasite that is capable of infecting all mammals. And you may recognize that humans happen to be mammals. And so even though this paper discusses cats and rats, I wanted to just give a quick fact, which is that if people are parasitized by T. gandhi, they are 2.5 times more likely to be involved in a car accident than people that are uninfected. And this is believed to be because this parasite can actually alter the behavior of the host. And that's why I call these zombie rats or the zombie parasite. Um, it, it, they're not actually zombies probably in the Hollywood sense, but it is still to me very interesting that these parasites can infect something and they can radically change the behavior of the host. So it's important to understand the life cycle of T. gandhi. Ultimately, T. gandhi wants to find its way into a cat host. And the reason for that is T. gandhi is only capable of reproducing inside of a cat, inside of a feline host. And so the way that this works is T. gandhi initially will infect a cat. That cat will then poop out eggs of T. gandhi. So within the cat poop is this parasite. Now one way that this parasite can propagate itself is if a cat then eats the poop of another infected cat. And in that way the parasite would remain in the cat population. But another way this happens is that this poop can also be eaten by rats. And you guys are just going to have to forgive my drawings because they're terrible. But rats may also eat this poop, and if they do, these rats become infected. But like I said, T. gandhi cannot reproduce inside of the rat host. So there is, uh, there's benefit to this parasite if it can make it back to a cat. Um, but as you can imagine, Rats are afraid of cats, so these, these rats will run away from cats, they are afraid of them. Uh, if you were to take even rats that have never been exposed to cats in, in hundreds of generations, they are still afraid of cats in the odors that are given off by cats. So these rats are afraid, they run away, and that's going to make it really difficult on this parasite to make it back to the cat host. So let me change the color real quick. So to overcome this problem, the authors talk about something called the manipulation, manipulation hypothesis. And the manipulation hypothesis basically states that the parasite will evolve mechanisms to alter the behavior of these intermediate hosts, the rat, change its behavior so that the transmission from the rat 
back into the cat is increased. You want an increased transfer from the rat back to the cat. That's what will benefit this parasite the most. Because if these rats are always running away from the cats, it doesn't do the parasite any good. So, what the authors of this paper are asking is can the parasite T. Gandhi change the behavior of the rat such that the rat becomes less afraid of the cat? And in doing so, you would expect that T. Gandhi can increase its rate of transmission. So what did the authors actually do? So they begin by taking uninfected lister hooded lister hooded rats uh, and they use this particular strain these lister hooded rats because they have behaviors that are very similar to a natural population of rats so they take these rats and they divide them up into two groups of 32 rats each and in the first group they inoculate the rats with a saline solution that contains these cysts. They contain the actual T. Gandhi parasites. T. Gandhi. So basically in this group they infect the rats with T. Gandhi and in their control group, this is the group that we're going to be making our comparisons to, they only give the rats saline but not T. Gandhi. So this is just saline and so you have uninfected rats over here. So then they take the rats and they place them in this in this box. And this box is divided up into different cells and in each corner they put straw. They put this straw bedding that the rats would use for like a nest. And so in one corner it smells like uh, basically uh, the rat's own smell, the rat's own funk <laughs> that they have in their bedding. In another corner they use rabbit urine and they place that on untreated straw. In another corner, they put cat urine. And in a final corner, they just have straw with uh, water. And then they hook up a camera above this little nest, and they record the rat's behavior inside of these, uh, inside of this little contraption that they set up they look at the rat's behavior over a 12-hour period. And so by recording the behavior over this 12-hour period, they can find where these rats are traveling within this box. So if the rats are spending more time towards, towards their own smell, they're going to be in these sections, or in the paper they call them cells. But if the rats then travel towards the cat urine, they're going to be found over here and over here towards the water. So basically they're looking at where are these rats going? Where are they spending their most time relative to these different smells? Okay, so now we'll look at what the authors actually found. And if you guys are following along, this is figure one in the paper. And uh, so the way I like to approach these figures is first just define uh, what is on the X and Y axis, what's being represented here. Uh, so if you look at the X axis, we have each subdivision of the box that we just talked about. So we have the rats, uh, the rats own smell from one corner. We have what they're calling the neutral corner. This is our water corner. We have the rabbit urine. And lastly, we have cat urine. That's the x-axis. Then on the y-axis, what we have 
is the mean or the average uh, number of visits made to each cell. So for instance, uh, if a rat visits its own corner, it'll be marked as 1 here. And I think they go up to about 30, 30 cell visits. So, so let me show you what I'm talking about. Uh, what, what they mean is, how often is a rat hanging out in these areas? So these would all be marked as the rat's own smell, whereas over here, these would be marked as the rat visiting the cat urine and here is neutral, and so on. So that's what's being represented in this figure. So now if we go back to our figure, what they show is that, um, let, let's first look at the, uh, we'll look at the uninfected rats. So we're gonna say white equals uninfected. So these were our 32 rats that were uninfected. So if we look at where these rats prefer to spend their time, and remember that this is just the, these are the uninfected rats. What we find is that the rats spend most of their time visiting sites near their own nest, near their own smell. That's where they like to spend most of their time. A little bit less in these two other categories, but they spend the least amount of time near the cat urine. And that's what we would expect. We expect that these rats are trying to avoid signs of predators. If they smell a cat, they don't want to be there. But what happens now in the uninfected group? And in this group, we'll make these red. So these red bars are going to represent our infected rats. And we have about 23 of these. So uh, these rats also spend uh, about a similar amount of time as the uninfected rats hanging out in their own smell. So, so you'll notice some differences here, but what we say is that these are not significant, that these differences are probably just due to chance. It's just, you know, there's no real difference. There's not a, a significant difference between those two. Um, and the same is true of these neutral, these neutral odors and uh, these rabbit, this rabbit urine. These are all not significant differences. They're about the same. You can think of it that way. Those are about the same. Sorry to harp on that over and over. <laughs> um, but now something really funny happens with the cat urine, which is that for whatever reason, these rats actually spend quite a lot of time hanging near cat urine. And we call this difference significant. And it's usually denoted by a star. Um, so, so what this means is that these uninfected rats in red spent a lot more time, a significant amount of time uh, near the cat urine relative to these uninfected rats. And you'll notice actually that Aside from their own nest, they spent the second most amount of time towards this cat urine. So I've been saying time, but really you should think of this in terms of visits. But these, these rats were visiting these cat urine cells way more when they were infected than when they were uninfected. So, so that was figure one. That was the first thing they found. And now uh, let's talk about figure two. Okay, so again, if you're following along, we are on figure two. And for this figure, they're only looking at the top 25% most active, most active rats. And again, I want to start by just defining these two axes. So on the x-axis, we have what they are calling sorties. And I had to look this up, but what a sortie is, is it's basically when the rat leaves its nest, it wanders around in the box, and then it retreats back to its own nest. And that's considered, and from my understanding, that's what the sorties are. Now on the y-axis, they have the cumulative 
uh, preference is what they're calling it cumulative preference but what you can think of this being what this is what they're calculating here is uh, the number of times that the rat would visit the cat urine versus the number of times the rat would visit the rabbit urine so a uh, positive value would indicate that the rat is spending more time near the cat urine and a negative value means that they're spending more time near the rabbit urine and we'll say that this is zero so what we find is that in the and again let's let's get our colors right so in white we are saying that these are again uninfected and what we see is that over time these rats are spending more of their time with the rabbits Whoop. Whoop. so now what happens when we look at the infected rats these rats are doing almost the exact opposite over time they're spending more of their time visiting the cat urine and that's so unusual because cats are bad because cats eat rats and I guess and I guess this is this is Satan the cat so it's unusual that these rats are preferring to go towards these cats and the only difference between these two groups is whether they're infected or uninfected and so that's basically what this paper is presenting it's quite simple uh, but it's very interesting so we know that most rats most rats are afraid of cats and that's because cats eat rats but if you infect a rat with T. Gandhi these rats seem to almost develop an attraction for these cats but why is that well under the manipulation hypothesis this parasite is changing the behavior of the rat so that the rat spends more time near the cat and increases the likelihood that this parasite can be transmitted back to the cat. And how is this happening? This is a question that we probably don't know the answer to. And there's probably a lot of different things going on, especially in the brain of this rat, which is where T. Gandhi can be found. But the authors suggest that what might be happening is that T. Gandhi is actually reducing the anxiety in these rats. So the anxiety that they would experience usually when they are encountering uh, something like cat urine that would lead them away from the cat urine, they don't feel that anymore. They don't have that same reaction. And by decreasing the anxiety, it increases the time spent near cats. Time spent near cats. And by doing so, again, it increases the transmission of this parasite. That's all I got for you guys today. Thank you guys so much for watching. And again, thank you for all your support. Uh, subscribe if you guys want to go on more adventures. And I'll see you in the next one. Bye.